O oh, love that will not let us go. I love that hymn. <sighs> Praise Jesus. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Father in heaven, thank you so much. You never let us go. No matter what we feel, your truth remains. Your truth stands. You are always with us. And we fear no evil. Even though we walk through this valley of the shadow of death, we thank you that you are in control. We thank you that you watch over our lives. Holy Spirit, you provide for us. We ask that the words that are spoken right now would be to your glory. Use our frail vessels to proclaim your truth. Let no words of these uh, fall on deaf ears. You watch over your word to perform it. Use our vessels, O oh God. Use these uh, jars of clay to shine forth a glorious light. For you, Jesus, we thank you. Your mercy endures forever. God, move in the city. We ask that you would move in the city. Move in our area. Continue rising, raising up the nobodies. Just that, like that vision you gave with Tommy Hicks, the nobodies that became warriors baptized in the Holy Spirit on fire for Jesus. Amen. Destroy the establishment, the ones that don't want to move, lift a finger, that the ones that sit on the sideline and are not, com not comfortable, but they're comfortable where they are. God, make us uncomfortable. Because you didn't come to make us comfortable. You come to upset the apple cart, to make us holy. Fire isn't comfortable. And the more you turn up the fire, the less comfort there is. But there's goodness. There's gold, silver, and precious gems on the other side. Oh God, don't ever let us don't ever let us be complacent. Oh God, forgive us where we are for those also who are actively uh, doing your things. God, I confess now. Let us not be critical of those who are not doing things. Let us let us love in patience and endurance, lifting up those who just need some encouragement. Oh God, help us to be more patient. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we were just singing a Matt Marr song, Abide With Me, and um, as I was singing that song, um, the Lord was just ministering to my heart, and so um, He was saying to me this, things have to get desperate before the Lord shows His full glory. And He just brought back real quick a few things in my mind, and I feel like it goes with what we're going to talk about, so I'm just going to share a couple just a couple little stories. Um, when we were moving from Orlando to Ohio, and the Lord had called us, and it was this crazy adventure. He said to, we were going to go as Abraham went. We knew we were supposed to go to Ohio, but we didn't know where. And we literally would drive and, and stop whenever we got to uh, one of the welcome centers as we were moving up the states from Florida to Ohio. And we would peer at the map there under the plexiglass and, um, and look at this map of the new state that we had just entered and say, okay, Lord, where do we go from here? And he would pull out a a roadway, and we would drive to the next place, and then we'd drive to the next place. We did this for three days until we made it into Ohio, and um, the Lord, through a dear brother of ours, uh, a conversation they were having, he was talking about the Amish, and that just like resonated us. But we were in the in the mountains of West Virginia at the time, and so reception wasn't good, and he was cutting in and out, and he was trying to give us like this directional of like where 
the Amish were or something. Anyway, we completely misunderstood the message because the message he was trying to send, but we got the message God was trying to send that we were supposed to go to the Amish. And so we drove up, we ended up in Canton, Ohio, thinking that that's where the Amish were, and uh, and found out that there are no Amish in Canton, Ohio. Um, if you remember going into the um, like Dollar General or whatever store it was and saying, you know, so where are the Amish? And they looked at me like I was an alien and, you know, they said, not here. Maybe there's some in Navarre. And we sat back in the in our uh, cars and felt completely defeated. We're like, here, we, we have we made a terrible, terrible mistake that we are all the way in Ohio, in this place we don't know anybody, and, and we thought we were following the Lord. Lord, did you lead us wrong? Did we hear wrong? Did we make this big, horrible mistake? And now we have zero money. I mean, I am not kidding when I say my kids were richer than we were at that moment because they had more change that they had found in the back seat than we had in our pocket. We literally had used everything up. And um, all these accusations and all this, these voices about how stupid we were and how everybody was going to laugh at us and how we had heard wrong and we thought we were so smart and we were following God and all this stuff and I just heard it and it was ridiculing. And I was about under, like to collapse under the weight of this. It was so dark. And um, we cried out to the Lord in that moment. It's like we couldn't even answer anything. We couldn't say anything. There was just no rebuke to that in my mind. I just, just was feeling it. And God sent a precious lady uh, from our home church who called. And she, uh, hearing what had happened and where we were, she just immediately began praying for us. I don't think she knew all about the voices that were going on in my head and in Eris's head, but she began to pray over us, and light came, and we were refreshed in our spirit. It didn't solve our problem, but we were refreshed in our spirit to keep going. And so we got back in the cars, and we drove to Navarre, which was the next little town over, and ended up, um, to tell you how little we knew about the Amish, we were looking for an Amish church, and they don't have on those churches. Um, they meet in barns and so forth. But uh, we typed it in in the GPS anyway and uh, found this this home. And it had been sold to somebody else like seven years prior. And um, and so it was completely unupdated, the maps were. But, um, but that family said, hey, you know, why are you looking for a church anyway? You're Jewish. Eris had his, his keep on and all this. And he says, well, I... Yeah, I was I was born in Israel, but I love Jesus. And he said, well, you could stay here. And so we just stayed in their front yard, and it was a miserable night. It was so, it was just like dark. We didn't sleep. It was cold. When we left Florida, it was 100 degrees. There, that first night in Ohio, it was like 32, and we had no clothes for that kind of weather. We were in shorts and T-shirt, and we were just like so frozen. And the kids moaned all night long, and I was six months pregnant and very uncomfortable. Uh, and it was just really dark. And yet, at that point, you know, we knew that, okay, this is really hard, but God has something for us. And in that very fitful night, uh, and in the devotional time the next morning, the Lord said to us, go to the Amish. And then he gave me a message, and he said, find a Mennonite minister. And the answer was yes. We were to go to the Amish, and we were to find a Mennonite minister. And as the story goes, we we did both of those things. The Mennonite minister led us to the Amish. <laughs> so uh, it did come out, and we were successful, not because we did anything great, but because we followed and trusted in the Lord. But it had to get really, really dark before the light could shine through, before we could burst forth. And I feel like we're in another season where we are learning to depend in the dark on the Lord. Because that's where you learn to depend. And I can remember as a, as a child in a youth group, 
And they were talking about how we need to have faith in God. And so they were going to do like a little activity to help us understand this. And so they blindfold one of the kids and then they'd say, okay, um, do you trust that I'll catch you if you fall backwards, you know, and you don't see me, you're blindfolded, whatever. And, you know, so they get some kid that's willing to actually do this. And they um, they put the blindfold on and they say, okay, now they'll fall backwards. And you see every kid does it the same way. So they start to go back and then they go stumble, stumble, step, 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 back. Because in reality they don't really believe that the guy behind them is going to catch them. And I feel like we do that to God so often. We, we'll believe a little bit, we'll bend a little bit, we'll raise our hands a little bit. But don't make me do something where I might actually fall. Because I'm afraid that you might not catch me. And, you know, where do we get that fear? We get that fear from our original parents' fall. Because they made a bad choice. And that bad choice led in a whole flood of fear. And now we, we look at everybody and we think they're all going to fall us. We're all going to be... Um, left hanging out there to fend for ourselves. And so that's really what this seal is about, this third seal. It is a ministry of darkness that God uses to teach us dependence on Him, that He is 100% dependable. No matter what happens, no matter how dark the situation looks. So um, let's, let's dive in. In Revelation 6, and um, I'm going to look at it little bit by little bit. So this is Revelation 6, 5 through 6. This is from the HDSB. When he, that is the lamb who was slain, opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there was a black horse. And the horseman had on it a set of scales in his hands. Now I want to remind you that from heaven's perspective, the one who is opening the scrolls is the Lion of Judah. But from earth's perspective, he's the Lamb that was slain. And the Lamb that was slain carries with it the epitome of the love sacrifice for us. That which is being done is out of love. And we must not forget that because it doesn't always look loving, particularly not to our flesh. Because if we were to have our desires, we would want to live a happy, conflict-free, comfortable life that has zero pain, zero struggle, zero unknowns, that's stuff we don't like. That's Our flesh just really hates that. But God's desire for us is the utmost of dependency on Him. He wants us to say, yes, you are the all-sufficient one. And, and, and I want to be joined with you. So that's His goal, which is very different than our flesh's nature, natural goal. Okay? Um, the second thing we need to remember is that he's opening the seals on a scroll, and that scroll is a plan. This is not chaos, guys. It is organized. There's a plan. And this is going according to the plan. And as he opens up these, these seals, more of the plan is being revealed. And that scroll is written on both sides. There's a side that heads towards the earth, and a side that's shining up towards heaven. And it's, it's being opened and read to everybody, both the heavens and the earth. The plan is stated for us, and it's a kingdom of priests who will reign. Now, this is not a new plan that just is revealed in Revelation. This is a plan that is revealed in Exodus, actually where the people are told through, by God through Moses that he wants a kingdom of priests. That's why he was saving them and taking them out of their slavery in Egypt, is he wants a kingdom of priests for himself. Okay? So it's the same plan that he, he spoke to the children of Israel so many years ago when they were still in slavery. 
and coming out. All right. So our third seal, when we open it, we're going to get a little perspective. John hears something. He hears the word come. But what he sees is this black horse. I really like my little medieval picture here. Uh, black horse and a guy with scales. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I did want to put the verses up there so that you can take it and and study more at home because um, it's a good thing to do. <laughs> reading the Bible is a good thing to do. You should do it. And I uh, read it. If you're not reading it straight through, I would I'd just like give a little plug for the Bible here. Read it straight through. Just start Genesis and read all the way through. Every story is important. Even those long lists of names are all important. Everything's important because all of it was breathed by God. And it's all inspired by God. And it's all for your benefit. It's to show his love to you. And if you don't know the stories, you won't know the patterns. Please don't just read one portion because it's particularly fun for you or it just piques your interest. Read the whole counsel of the word of God. And then let him show you what he will out of it. All right. All right. So I will take a look real quick at Job. (laughs) Most people know the story of Job. Um, we're going to talk at it, um, about it at length here um, probably next week. But um, this black horse, the horse is a, is a sign of there's a, a conflict that's going on. And that conflict um, is one of a war-type nature. That's what horses symbolize. Um, the fact that it's black brings with it the feeling of mourning or famine or sorrow or death. Those are all ideas that are wrapped up in the color black in the Bible. Um, Here at Job uh, 30 gives us a good picture of that. Starting in verse 26, he says, Yet no one would stretch out his hand against the ruined man when he cries out to help, uh, to him for help because of his distress. Have I not wept for those who have fallen on hard times? Has not my soul not grieved for the needy? But when I hoped for good, evil came. And when I looked for light, darkness or blackness came. I am churning within and I can't rest. The days of suffering confront me. I walk about blackened, but not by the sun. I stood in the assembly and cried out for help. I have become a brother to the jackals. And a companion of ostriches. That means he was an outcast. My skin blackens and flakes off. My bones burn with fever. My lyre is used for mourning and my flute for the sound of weeping. This is not a pleasant section to read. It is um, a lament of the depths of Job's soul. He's been, he's lost everything, all of his worldly goods. He's lost his status. He's lost his physical health. And he's, he is in mourning, deep mourning for his condition. And he says, I cry out for help and there's nobody to help me. They've just abandoned me. And, uh, and so he describes his condition as black. Black in body, black in spirit. Alright? Um, he didn't do anything wrong, by the way, in the sense he was chosen out because of his righteousness. Um, And the Lord was going to teach him something through this trial. But it wasn't because he was some sort of wicked person and God was was punishing him. Micah gives us another picture of blackness. Micah's a minor prophet. (coughs) Which means he wrote a small book, yes. Doesn't mean that he didn't write an, an important book. It just meant that it was small. Um... So Micah is prophesying to Israel and he he is speaking the words of God to some false prophets. And, you know, prophets were people who were supposed to have insight from God. They were supposed to have God's words and and to help guide the people in the right way to live. And um, these prophets were not prophesying God's word. They were prophesying falsely. And so Micah has this to say to them. Um, because of their false prophecies, God says, Therefore it will be night for you without visions. It will grow dark 
for you without divination. The sun will set on these prophets, and the daylight will turn black over them, and the seers will be ashamed, and the diviners will be disappointed, and they will all cover their mouths, because there will be no answer from God. This is a, a death blow if you are a prophet, because your whole job was to speak the words of God. And if you can't hear from God, you had no spiritual insight, you would have nothing to say. So uh, this was a really bad thing for these prophets. And it was because of their disobedience and their false prophecies that God was saying, I will not speak to you or through you. This shows a different kind of darkness. It's a darkness of the spiritual realm. And... um, and so we can see that darkness is not just related to our physical bodies or um, our, our outside circumstances, but also can be an internal thing. You can be in darkness inside. We had that experience in Israel when um, we were trying to figure out what to do. We had done everything we knew to establish. We thought that that's what the Lord wanted us to do, to establish in the land. We knew he had called us to Israel. And um, and yet I couldn't find any work, and I couldn't get a visa to work, and and we just couldn't make ends meet. And I can remember sitting on a bench outside of our apartment in Haifa. It was a beautiful day, as the days are there. Blue skies, not a cloud in the sky. Sun was brightly shining down. The weather was beautiful. And yet I felt like it was black, like it was the middle of the darkest midnight with no moon. Because we had no insight in what we were supposed to do. We didn't know where we were supposed to go. We didn't know how we were supposed to get there. We just knew that everything was black. It was to the point where I, I think it was that night or the night thereafter, was actually contemplating jumping out of our third story window and I'm not being facetious. I really was thinking, it might be better if I jump out the window than if I stay in this situation because we are in such a hopeless spot. You know, sometimes God lets his beloved ones go through very, very, very dark periods of time. And it's not because he hates you. It's because he is trying to teach you how good he is. He will hold you fast. If you will continue to trust in him, it has to, you know, there's a quote, I'm not sure where it comes from, but it says that it's darkest before the dawn. The darkest part of the night is before the dawn. And um, I love the verse that, that states that joy comes in the morning. And, and it doesn't matter how you write that word morning. If it's M-O-R-N-I-N-G, morning, like not night, Okay, on the morrow, that seems to work, but it also comes in the M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, the morning time period, when you are, are full of tears, when you get to the end of yourself, and you just throw yourself on God and say, well, I've gone this far, I can't go any further, you're just going to have to make up because I, I can't do anything, I'm just holding on to you. And that's when the breakthrough happens. All right, he's a rider, he's on a black horse, and he has skills. Now, the skills, and I have some verses up there, and I'm not going to them, but the skills are a picture of God's divine judging. Now, I want to clear something up. Sometimes we think of judgment as being always in the negative. That is not true. Judgment means he makes a decree about a certain thing. It could be positive, like you have just done something and it has been judged faithful and true and right and correct. Or it could be negative, like you've been found wanting. Okay? You didn't do a good job. Judgment is just the action of deciding whether it was a good or a bad thing. And that is reserved for God. He judged during the time of Noah, who was righteous and who was wicked. Noah was judged righteous. The rest of the world was judged wicked. The judgment was that action of deciding. Okay? 
So don't think that just because they're being judged it's automatically bad. But he's weighing things out. And I think what he does with us is he weighs out our heart's intentions, our heart's motives. And he weighs out our heart's desires. We see this in some, in, in like when Samuel comes to Jesse's house and he says, I, I have come to anoint a king from your family, Jesse. Bring the boys out. And Jesse brings out all his sons and he lines them up from oldest to youngest. And, and God has already told Samuel, you're going to anoint who I show you. I look at the inside. I judge the inside, not the outside appearance. Okay? So Samuel starts going down the line. He sees the first strapping lad and he says, hey, this one would be a good pick. He's tall. He's handsome. He looks strong. He presents well. And God says, not him. I've rejected him. Then he goes to the next one. I've rejected him. Next one. I've rejected him. All the way down the line, I've rejected, rejected, rejected. And Jesse, uh, uh, Samuel looks at Jesse and goes, don't you have anybody else? God's rejected all of these. And he says, well, there's one who's watching the sheep. Call David. They go call David. And he looks at this runt of a kid. Young man. With red cheeks. Maybe from running all the way from the shepherd's place wherever he was pasturing all those sheep. You know, probably stinky. Certainly unkept being a shepherd, right? And God says, that's the one. That's the one who's going to shepherd my people. I look at the heart. I judge the heart. So we know that when God judges, he doesn't judge like people. He judges in a different way. He's concerned about what we think and how we feel and why we do the things that we do. And, you know, he sees us perfectly. Hebrews tells us that, that he sees everything that's in our heart. But we don't even see ourselves perfectly. And so he will reveal to us the hidden nature of our heart in order to cleanse it. And we talked about this before, that God wants all of us. He jealously is yearning for our complete heart. And he will remove anything that's standing in the way of that attaining our heart. And sometimes... We aren't even aware of what's standing in the way. So these circumstances often have the effect to show us what's in our heart. Our, we might have thought we depended on God, but now all of a sudden we realize, hmm, maybe I didn't. Okay. Next one, baby. Psalm 78. We're going to go there if you have your Bibles. Psalm 78 is a long psalm. I'm not going to read all of it. It's a historical psalm written by Asaph. Please do read it, though. It's a, it's a good mini-history of, uh, of Israel. Asaph wrote it um, because he didn't want his generation to fall into the same sins that uh, the, the children of Israel, when they had... Um, been set free from Egypt. He didn't want them to wander around in the wilderness in rebellion like their forefathers did. And so he's telling the story of Israel over again in this long psalm. Um, <clears throat> Yahweh reveals himself to Israel and then Israel responds to Yahweh. And I want to look at a few of these verses to show how he revealed himself. Starting in verse 13, it says that God split the sea and he brought them, that's Israel, across the sea. And the water stood firm like a wall. He led them with a cloud by day and a fiery light throughout the night. He split the rocks in the wilderness and he gave them an abundance uh, to drink. Drink as abundant as the depths. He brought streams out of the stone, and he made the water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, and they 
were rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They deliberately tested God, saying, Is God able to provide food in the wilderness? Look, he struck the rock and the water gushed out and torrents overflowed, but can he also provide bread or furnish meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this, and he became furious. And then fire broke out against Jacob, and anger flared up against Israel, because they did not believe God or rely on his salvation. He gave a command to the clouds above, and he opened the doors of heaven, and he opened, um, he rang down manna for them to eat, and he gave them grain from heaven. People ate the food of the angels. What a thought is that? He gave them his own supply from heaven. He sent them an abundant supply of food. And then he made the east wind blow in the skies, and he drove the south wind by his might. He rained meat on them like dust and winged birds like the sands of the sea. He made them follow at his camp all around his feet, and they ate, and they were completely satisfied, for he gave them what they craved. Before they had satisfied their desire, while the food was still in their mouths, God's anger flared up against them, and he killed some of their best men, and he struck down Israel's choice young men. Despite all that, they kept on sinning. They did not believe his wonderful works. He made their days end in futility, their years in some disaster, and he killed some of them, and the rest began to seek him. They repented and searched for God. They remembered that God was their rock, the Most High God was their Redeemer. But... They deceived him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their hearts were insincere towards them. They were unfaithful to his covenant. Yet he was compassionate. He atoned for their guilt. He didn't destroy them. He often turned his anger aside and did not unleash his wrath. He remembered that they were only flesh. A wind that passes and does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They continually tested God and provoked the Holy One of Israel. This is not a real positive retelling of history. God revealed himself as being a powerful leader who could split open the seas. He could do miracles. He was a leader taking them step by step. That pillory cloud or fire by night. And he showed them the way that they were supposed to go. He provided food for them with bread and meat. But the people grumbled and complained continually. They didn't believe in the um, the miracle-working nature of God, even though they were watching the miracles. They, they minimalized them. And then when God did one, they weren't satisfied with that. They started to complain and say that he couldn't possibly do another miracle. Well, it worked that one time. must have been a fluke, you know. It was a fluke for manna to fall out of the sky. God couldn't possibly give us meat, too. It, it seems ludicrous. And yet that's their response. And God was angry with them because they failed to believe. And yet he was gracious to them. Because he remembered that they were just and they were fallen. And that that nature of flesh just couldn't understand the spiritual things of God. And so he, he just waited and was patient with them. Even though his anger would flare towards them, he stopped. And he would try again. It shows his loving kindness to them. Even when they said that they were going to follow, it's like the kid that says, really, 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 mommy, daddy, I won't do it again, ever, ever, ever. Please just don't fight me. Please just don't discipline me. I promise I'll never, ever do it again. I promise, I promise, I promise. Yeah. He's laughing at my at my three-year-old who does this. Yeah, just don't tell mommy, don't tell mommy. And yet, uh, that's what the children of Israel did. And and God got tired of that. And and you guys probably know the story. They ended up wandering in the wilderness. They couldn't enter into God's rest because of their unbelief and their disobedience. We don't obviously want to walk around in the wilderness 
wondering which way is up for 40 years. Thankfully, the faithful are given a response that's a bit better. Um, Miss Daniel, you'll have to skip the next one because I already talked through it. So skip two up. Uh, the righteous have a response, and their response is Psalm 139, 23 and 24. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all of my anxious cares and see if there's any path of pain that I'm walking on. Lead me back to your glorious, everlasting ways, the path that brings me back to you. You see, the righteous understand that there's going to be a judgment of their flesh nature. It's either going to happen here or it's going to happen at the end of time when they stand before God. And the righteous understands that it would be a lot better for the judgment to happen here because sin separates us from God. Even if you're a believer, when you sin against the Lord, it's not going to separate you in the sense of eternal damnation, but it will put a breakage between your relationship with God and you won't hear from Him as much. You won't feel as close to Him. You're not in harmony with Him. You're just, something's off. You're still His child, but there's a separation. And so the righteous can't, can't stand that thought. They say, I don't want that. I want to be close to you. And so show me if there's anything that's separating me from you. It also will, will give a clear conscience to the person who is a righteous person. When you, when you confess your sin, you don't have those accusations in your head. You don't have those nagging thoughts because you have a clear conscience before the Lord. So it brings peace into your body, into your, into your whole being. And it gives you an opportunity, as soon as you confess that sin, to change. Now, if you really honestly believe that God's ways are better than the world's ways, you would want to change to get in line with God's ways. I think sometimes we don't really believe that. We might say it with our mouths that we think God's ways are better, but in reality, we don't really believe it because we don't really want to confess our sins and repent from them and turn and change to God's ways. We sort of like to hold on to that special hidden sin that's in our life. And the righteous also know another thing. They know that the final judgment is final. And so if you wait to have your flesh judged and you go and live life your own way, the Bible says that even for believers, he's going to look at what you've done, how you've taken the resources he's given you of time and money and and heart and, and energy and say, what have you done for my kingdom? You're not going to have much to show for. He says that he's going to test everything that we've done, pass it through the fire. And the stuff that is wood and hair and stubble is going to be all burned up and you're going to enter in with nothing but yourself. But if you have of your heart sacrificed for the Lord and given to Him and done everything He's asked you to do, that too will be passed through the fire. And I'm sure parts of it will be burned up, but there will be leftover gold and precious stones and silver. Things that was built into your life as you've learned and you've, and you've sought to know the Lord more and more. And you will enter in with your reward. So the righteous says, search me. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not holding anything back. If there's anything that's wicked in me, bring it out. Because I don't want to walk in wickedness. This particular setting out of the judging rider on the black horse shows us the true nature of our heart. Next section of Revelation 6 says that John hears something like a voice from among the four creatures and they say a quart of wheat for a denarius 
and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Now, a denarius was a coin at that time that would be what you would get if you were like a day laborer. That's what you would get at the end of the day. They'd give you a denarius. And the quart of wheat or a quart of bar or three quarts of barley or a measure, some some say, it was basically, think it was the amount of food that you needed. You were just getting the food that you needed for the day. That's it, and of wheat. Um, and not a ton of food, but what did you want? Uh, but just what you needed. So um, I want to talk about wheat and barley. Both of them are food crops, obviously. They're useful for food. Um, but there's a couple of distinctions. Wheat was more expensive, and barley was for, uh, it was considered the poor man's food. Okay? That's why you could get more barley for a denarius than you could for the wheat. Um, barley is a spring crop. It's the one that matures first. And when it gets, this is barley, it's, uh, it, it turns white when it matures. And, um, biblically, it seems to be related to this, to a concept of faith. Um, and it, the three, the three measures, um, reminds me of the fathers, the Avot. They were the ones who had that dependence on the Lord. They just, they, they were told of the Lord, go to the land that I'll show you. And so they went. It, it's, the, it's the first step in our walk after salvation is to walk out in faith and dependence on the Lord. Maybe you don't understand all the things that God would require of you somewhere down the road, but you know God's voice, you hear it, and you obey it, just in childlike faith. And that's what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's what they did. And that's what they were commended for. And in fact, we're called children of Abraham if we walk out in faith after them. And, you know, I think of the story of Jesus, and he's looking out over the crowds, and he has compassion on them, and he wants to give them food. But, you know, the disciples are thinking, well, we can't afford to get food for these people. So what happens? A little boy is brought to Jesus, a little poor boy with some barley loaves and a couple of fish. And he gives his lunch to Jesus and says, here you go, you can have this. This is what I have. And God takes that poor boy's lunch and he breaks it up and it feeds everybody. Everyone. It, it, it's this bread of faith. It is... Um, see, I wanted to... I'll, I'll skip that. Okay. Wheat, on the other hand, is that which matures later. It's the fall crop. It turns golden... It's more desirable on the on the whole, and it's uh, it's more ex expensive. You offered wheat with all of the uh, meat sacrifices. Um, the finest wheat, it says in Leviticus, is to be offered. Um, it's the bread that's used on the table of showbread that's before the Lord, uh, that's changed out every every week. Um, and there's only one measure of it here. It's gold when it's ready to be harvested. And, and that reflects the divinity aspect. Um, I believe that this is really pointing to as we grow up, as we mature in the Lord, we know better what the Lord requires of us. Mm. And the Lord will tell you as he refines you, you know, do this, don't do that. You know, I, I want you to be holy before me. This is what that looks like for you. And he starts to convict you of certain things, and you start to offer those things up to the Lord. It's the latter crop. It's the thing that comes out as you walk with him more, that grows up. So you start with faith, and, and, and then it produces a righteousness, a holiness before the Lord. And that's what he's desiring for us. It also, this wheat and this uh, barley point to the Passover um, and ultimately to Yeshua. You know, Jesus was our Passover lamb 
And um, I have there the verses for you if you want to go look them up, both from Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, And he was the perfect sacrifice for us. And the Passover speaks of our salvation. Applying the blood on the lintel of our dwelling place made uh, it possible for the angel of death to pass over us because of that lamb's blood. And we know that when Yeshua died for us and, and that blood is applied upon us, in, in a metaphorical kind of way, when we claim his blood as an atonement for us, that death passes over us. We no longer have to pay for our own sins. Christ paid for it. Um, right after Passover is the unleavened bread, Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a seven-day feast. And it was a bread of affliction that they were supposed to eat and remember their exodus from uh, Egypt. They're leaving slavery and heading out towards uh, Mount Sinai where they were going to have a covenant with the Lord and then head right into the promised land and obtain milk and honey in their own place and be free. And, and that's what they were looking forward to. Okay, but they were supposed to have this unleavened bread, um, which was not carrying with it the leaven of Egypt. Okay, Egypt was the place of slavery and oppression and whatnot. And so um, they were going to be making this bread in haste, baking it on bricks as they went, and um, and to go out. And every year they would celebrate this as a memorial. And Jesus was our unleavened bread. It was, you know, generally made of wheat. And he was the only one who could be without leaven. He's the only one who could be without sin. And... He was the one who bore our afflictions. So, um, you know, sort of po- points to that, one measure of that, and it's priceless. It is, when we begin to walk in Christ's ways, we begin to look like Him. And the more we mature, the more we walk like Him, the more we look like Him. And it's Christ in us, living through us. And then you have the barley. The barley, as far as I know, is only used in the Feast of First Fruits. And in the, in the spring, when the barley um, comes into the ear, then they, they set the, that month of Aviv. And then at the Feast of First Fruits, they take a, a sheaf of barley and they wave it before the Lord as an offering, as like a first fruits offering. And... Um, on the third day, or, you know, it's sort of mirrored in the three measures, uh, Christ arose from the grave and was presented as a first fruits offering mm. to the Lord. And 1 Corinthians uh, 15, if you uh, look at that, will tell you about that, how he fulfills that, that offering as being waved before the Lord, the first resurrected from the dead. And, you know, he was the poorest of poor. He had no home. He wandered around. He lived off of the charity, if you will, of people who who gave to him. He had no name, really, uh, that he took, like in the sense of a title or accolades from any type of institution. He wasn't a great rabbi from some school of rabbis. He, he, He had no PhD. Yeah. He was just a carpenter's son, you know, and, and he got a lot of ridicule for that. He was poor from the earth standards, and yet he was praised. And he had, he, he, in a way, he walked out in maybe the greatest way, the greatest level of faith in allowing his body to be completely destroyed and believing that his father would do what he said he would do, raise him up on the third day. And so we walk in that same faith when we trust in his salvation, we trust in his righteousness, and righteousness that will live through us as we proclaim that, and we trust in the resurrection life that we will follow after him, because he was the first fruits, but not the last fruits. We are the ones who walk thereafter. Jesus said in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. Whether you're talking about barley or wheat, he is the bread that we partake in. No one who comes unto me will ever go hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever thirst. He's trying to show us 
that we can depend on him for every truly needy thing that we have, um, every, every need of our soul. There are some dangers in this time period. I call it the famine time period. It's not necessarily a famine from food. It can be a famine from pretty much anything, maybe insight or health, or it could be food or finances, um, or uh, maybe even friends or community where you feel like you're being starved in one way or another. And um, these famine periods, there's lots of them in the Bible. I pulled out a couple. Um, the wilderness is the one that we saw in Psalm 78. And the people, instead of worshiping God and, and asserting that they were going to hold on to who God was in His promises, and they were going to walk in that, instead of doing that, their response was to grumble and complain. And this is a big pitfall for this famine time period because our flesh hates being uh, told, no, you're not going to have what it feels like it needs. But I need community. And so we grumble and complain when we're alone. But I need food or I need that extra paycheck or I need this, right? And, and, and we, we don't like it when God says, no, you're going to go through this period where I'm going to show you that what you need is me. Amen. Okay? Hallelujah. If we will worship in faith, He will bring us through this, this difficult time, um, oftentimes faster. Um, when Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4, He was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for a time of testing. Obviously, Jesus had done nothing wrong. So testing is not related to punishment. Testing is related to testing. God wants to see, are you loyal to him? Are you going to um, to learn who he is and learn that his character is trustworthy? How are you going to respond? What's in your heart? Jesus goes into the wilderness at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He fasts for 40 days, and he doesn't eat anything, and he doesn't drink anything. And at the end of that time period, when he was hungry, which I would think would be an understatement, um, Satan comes to him and says, Why should you be going hungry if you're the Son of God? Why don't you just turn these stones into bread? And the temptation in the wilderness time period is to act on our own initiative outside of God's command. To try to solve our problems ourselves. You wait for a period of time, but at some point you get a little antsy and you think, I'm done waiting, the Lord's not coming through for me, so now I need to make a decision on my own. It's only print because I really need to eat. I mean... God wouldn't certainly want me to starve. And so we rationalize with ourselves and we don't wait on the Lord. And usually it gets worse right at the very end, right before the Lord breaks through. We had this um, when we were in Israel uh, and we knew that we were supposed to come back to the States, but we had no clue how that was going to happen because we didn't have the resources to get back to the States. And um, we were trusting that the Lord would provide for us. There was a program we were told about from the U.S. government for people who tried to um, to relocate to a different country, didn't work out. They would give you a loan to get back to the States. But that loan came at a price, a very high price, uh, interest-wise. It would have been crippling to us. And um, we were really encouraged to take that loan. And um, because that's the only way we were going to get back. And uh, we prayed about it. And the Lord said, no, don't take the loan. And we didn't know what else to do other than that. Well, when we told people, we're, we prayed about it, and we feel like the Lord is saying, no, we are not to take this loan. Well, they looked at us like they were we were crazy. You know, and I, probably if we were in their shoes, we would have looked at us sort of crazy too. But we knew what God had said, and and so at first it was they tried to talk us, you know, into reason. And then it was they tried to push us into reason. And then they just badgered us and called us all manners of name, names and, and accused us. You know, Satan sometimes uses people, 
And then when you have people who are yelling at you and you have uh, who are well-meaning, usually they're scared for you, is why they're yelling at you, <laughs> scared for themselves. Um, and then and then Satan's also accusing you inside, and, and it's like this huge psychological warfare going on in your head. We rolled on. Friday evening came. We were preparing for Shabbat, and... It had been a horrendous week. It was probably the darkest week we had experienced yet in our life. And um, right before Shabbat, we got an email that came in, and um, it said uh, from a friend of ours stateside who said, the Lord rebuked me for not offering my home to you when you said you were coming back to the States. He had told me to do so, and I didn't. He said, how, I asked the Lord, how can I make it up? And the Lord said, why are this amount to them? Where can I send you money? And we told him, and it was enough to cover our plane tickets to get back to the States. Now, at this point, we had uh, six children. So that means eight international flights uh, from Israel to America. And the prices had gone up from when we had originally gone over six months before. The Lord was good, and the light came at the end of the darkest of dark weeks. But you have to wait. You have to wait for his salvation. Wait, go. Back. Back. He moved me ahead. Uh, when Jesus sent out the disciples in Matthew 10... He um he told them where to go. He said I'm going to I'm going to send you with a message to go preach the kingdom of of heaven. You're not going to go to the Samaritan villages. You're only going to go to the people of Israel. And um you're going to do certain things. I'm giving you authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick and and um and so forth. And then he gave them um information about some very practical things like what they were to take with them. He says, um, let's see here, in verse 9, he says, don't take along gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt or sandals or a walking stick for the worker is worthy of their food. So here, Yeshua is sending them out on a mess, on a mission, and he's saying, "Don't take anything with you. No resources at all." This is so counter our culture. Like we are supposed to go with provisions, plenty of provisions, just in case if you run into something difficult along the way. And uh, in fact, you might want to have a plan B. It's, this is the world's wisdom. God says no. I am your only plan. You depend on me. And he actually sent them out with nothing. And he makes a comment um, in verse 16. He says, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. He knew it was hard the way he was sending them out. It's going to look like you're going to be devoured. And you have zero defenses. But what he was saying is, I'm your good shepherd. Whoa. I'm with you. Go out in power. Amen. So these are our dangers to, to forget, to look at our circumstances and look at the material goods and, and not remember that, um, that the Lord is in control of all of this. Also, um, Satan will deceive us and encourage us to believe his lies that he will be speaking about God into our head during these dark times. He'll say things like, God's abandoned you. You must have done something wrong because he's not answering you. You've, you've probably messed this one up. You just didn't hear. Maybe you're not even a sheep. He'll, he'll speak all these manners of lies. You're alone. God's not as good as he said he was in his word. Look at how he's left you unprotected. All of these things will come into your head to try to get you to waver in your faith in Him. 
See why you need the barley and the wheat? Both of them. You need the faith, and that's going to develop the character in you. So I had used this um, this little diagram. I don't know. When we were in creation, God created us secure. But then after the fall, we felt abandoned by God and unprotected by God. And that's where Satan's going to hit you because of our fallen nature. He's going to speak to that, and he's going to start speaking the way we feel. And that comes a point of us making a choice. Are we going to live by our feelings, or are we going to believe what God says is true? And you have to make that choice. And when you make that choice to believe, you are exercising your faith. The way that you learn this dependence on God, that's your redemption road. And it's through those dark times of famine that that happens. As you walk along the road, God will reveal something to you about himself. He reveals that he is El Shaddai. He is the God who is the all-sufficient one. Everything you need is related or found in him. And, and the word Shaddai, I love this. Uh, El is God. Shaddai, uh, sufficient one, is related to the, the word that's used of a mother's breast. And in the same way that a baby finds all of its, its needs met in its mother's breast, its food, its comfort, it's even warmed, its breathing is regulated on the chest of its mother, its heartbeat is regula- regulated on the chest of its mother, all of that happens Right there, it is the perfect package for the baby, for its growth and survival. And that's what, that's, that's the picture that God uses of Himself. If you'll just lean on me and rest in me, I'll provide everything you need, every comfort that you need, all the food you need, all the nourishment you need for you to grow and to become strong. When we depend on the Lord and we rest in Him, even when we can't see, especially when we can't see, then we will mature, we will grow, and what will be developed in us is trust and joy and will be brought into wholeness. And a sense of security will take the place of that sense of abandonment that our flesh experienced because of the fall. We've been going through a... Um, a study, and uh, it's called The Steps to Freedom in Christ, and part of that is renouncing the things that Satan says about us and accepting, believing, proclaiming, or announcing the things that God says about us. So as Satan is whispering in your ear that you're guilty or unprotected or alone or abandoned, the proper response to that is to proclaim, I am free from condemnation. I am assured that everything that I'm going through is going to work together for good. I am free from any condemning charges against me because my faith and trust is in Christ. I cannot be separated from the love of God no matter how alone I feel at this moment. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God, and I am confident that the good work God has begun in me will be perfected. I am a citizen of heaven, and I'm hidden with Christ in God. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I can find grace and mercy in the, in, uh, to help in my times of need. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. We are 100% secure in Christ. The very last thing of this Revelation 6 is the statement, don't harm the oil or the wine. And that's really sort of the silver lining of the seal, if you will. When you start to see the circumstances that you're going in from a heavenly perspective instead of an earthly perspective, then you begin to see things a little differently. When you see in the first seal... You see a promise of victory through Jesus, the conquering one. When you start seeing it from heaven's perspective, you're not seeing someone coming to take everything away from you. You begin to see, ah, he is coming to save me. 
and continue to save me from myself. The second seal, if you remember, is that uh, fiery horse, and it brings a sword between us and and other people as he's he's dividing out our human affections. And when you're thinking fleshly, you think, oh no, I've lost this relationship, I've lost that relationship, I can't be around those people any longer, and it feels really painful. But when you begin to look from heaven's perspective, you go, I have gained the Lord of life and love and, and joy. I have gained the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I am united with Him. And I have gained everything. So from heaven's perspective, you've only lost a few negative relationships, but you gained everything. The third seal, you may lose or have darkness in your life for a period of time. You may lose certain things, certain uh, earthly things that you used to put trust in, whether it be finances or um, certain status or wisdom or understanding from the world's perspective. But what you gain is an an unfailing dependence on the Lord and, and security in Him. And that's the silver lining if you will, to the seal, a heavenly perspective. Remember I told you that each seal opens up a bit of that scroll that's written on both sides, the heaven side and the earth side. There are two things that we see in seal three. One is an anointing, the oil. Don't harm the oil. This is like the best thing. You want to talk about security. Oil was used to light, give you light. It was used for bodily maintenance, you know, to soften your skin and for healing of wounds and things like that. But its primary use in the scripture is for anointing. And there were two things that were anointed. The the anointing was for, um, like, sanctifying, consecrating. But there were two types of people that were often anointed. They were the priests. And kings, the priest and kings. And when you were anointed, you couldn't get unanointed. Once anointed a king, you were a king. That's right. And once anointed a priest, you were a priest. And David understood this really well. He says, touch not, or well, it was actually a prophet, touch not my anointed ones. But King David refused to kill Saul, even though he had the opportunity multiple times, because he was the anointed of the Lord. He recognized there was something special about him because he had been anointed, even though Saul had tried to take his life personally multiple times. And this anointing is then put upon us. In the, in the New Testament, it says that we are anointed in Christ. And it can't be taken away from you. That's why here in Revelation it says, don't harm that oil. You can't touch it. So even though you're going through a dark time as a believer, your anointing cannot be removed from you. And and what was the plan again? But to become a kingdom of reigning priests. So anointed twice over, if you will. It can't be removed from you. And then the wine. The wine is always a symbol of joy and gladness. Or a comfort sometimes. They say to give wine to those who are perishing. The Lord says, don't take that from them either. There is a joy that comes in the Holy Spirit when you are submitted to going through the dark times and you trust yourself to the Lord and you say, well, do with me what you must. I submit to you. There is a joy that comes that is unexplainable. And it's from the Lord. Our response is to ask for enough. Sometimes we get ourselves in trouble because we have too much. And so I think it was really wise in Proverbs when, um, let's see here, this was uh, Agur, right? For the son of Agur? Agur, son of Yake. Agur, son of Yake. He was saying this, he says, Every promise 
from the faithful God is pure and proves to be true. He is a wraparound shield of protection for all of his lovers who hide, want, run in him to hide. Don't add to his words or he will have to rebuke you and prove that you're a liar. Don't go beyond what he says. God, there are two things I ask for you before I die, only two. Empty out my heart of everything that's false, every lie, every crooked thing. That's sort of our search my heart and know my ways. And give me neither undue poverty nor undue wealth, but rather feed my soul with a measure of prosperity that pleases you. May my satisfaction be found in you. Don't let me be so rich that I don't need you or so poor that I have to resort to dishonesty just to make ends meet. Then my life will never detract from bringing glory to your name. And, you know, his heart is just give me what I need and may it ultimately be that you are the thing that I need. So in the material world, just give me, give me what you deem is right for me. Jesus sort of echoes this in his Lord's Prayer, when he says, um, give us our daily bread. Don't give us our weekly bread, our monthly bread, bread in the storehouse in case of the economy collapses. Give us our daily bread. Give me what I need for right now. And what he's saying is we need to be in a constant state of dependence. You know, and one other thing about bread is that while it's obviously necessary for our physical body, bread is also the metaphor for the Word of God. And we need that daily bread from Him. So that returns us right back to the beginning and the admonition to get in the Bible and read it daily. Don't wait for a Sunday sermon or a Saturday sermon. Get into the Bible daily. You need it daily. And the Lord will give it daily if you'll ask. Praise God. Um, so this demon scales, I, I have to preach the gospel. I have to give the message of the gospel. Leanne quoted Daniel dealing with the scales. And Lord, I just pray you give me quick. Because it was a, it was a very... Uh, in-depth look at the um, third seal, the promise of God providing for you if you just trust Him. And you look at Belshazzar in Daniel 5, Belshazzar, excuse me, he says, you've not, Daniel says, you have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. Instead, you've exalted yourself against the Lord of Heaven. Belshazzar was a for a little kid. He had it all. And he said, Hey, bring out those vessels. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. And the tekel, some translations say shekel, means you have been weighed in the balance and found deficient. Matthew 25, verse 14. The parable of the talents. This is a message not just for the non-believer. This is also a message for the believer. Uh, for this, uh, the parable of the talents which is the kingdom of heaven like just like a man going on a journey called his own slaves turned over his possessions to them to one he gave five talents to another two and to another one to each according to his own ability to anyone on a journey immediately the man who received five talents went put them to work and earned five more in the same way the man who earned two earned two more but the man who had received one talent went off dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money couple things very important. One, that servant belonged to a master. He was part of a kingdom, of some sort of rule. He was not a independent contractor. He was not some derelict. He was not... Someone owned him. He belonged to someone and he was given something. He approached him man the five talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. With the two talents, he said the same. Share your master's joy. You were faithful. 
The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you, you're a difficult man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathered where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid, went off and hid your talent in the ground. Look what you have is yours. His master replied, You evil, lazy slave, you wicked servant. I own you, you are my servant, and you didn't do. This is a, this is a believer. You have a talent, you are given, and then if you hide it, you wicked, faithless servant. You knew what you should have done, and you didn't do it. He says, I'm going to throw you good for nothing, slave into the outer darkness in that place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the HCSB. Friends, if you're hearing this message, and you know what you should do in the light of Jesus, if you have given your life to Him and He's calling you, calling you, calling you into this walk and you're denying Him before men and yes, you've given your life to Jesus. Yes, I, 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 Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And, but, you know, in the workplace, you need to be careful how you talk. And You know what? If they fire you, let them fire you. Now, I'm not saying be disrespectful to employers. I'm not saying that. But are you willing to pay the price? Last time I checked, the one that you pledged allegiance to, he paid the price for you. Shall we not be in like manner? Be willing to pay the price for him? I'm not saying be dishonoring to the government. God forbid, I would never, never say that. I would never say be dishonoring to your employer. What I am saying is don't hide your faith. What I am saying is you were given a commission. You were given a general order. Share the love of Jesus. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. When someone, I had a dear brother, share with me, he was, he was sort of distraught. He loved Jesus. And he said, Ed, what do I do when someone just says, you know, gee, gee, this, and, and, and they take Jesus' name in vain? I would tell them, friend, I don't appreciate that. You're talking about my precious Savior, the one I love. I ask you to please stop. And if they tell you, go fly a kite, say, God bless you, I love you, please stop what you're doing. It's wrong. It goes against what Jesus says. And you're hurting me and you're hurting him. And if they still revile you, this is when you can pray for them. If they decide to complain about you because you, in kindness and in love, spoke Jesus and the truth you know that's the price to pay because in light of eternity that job's going to burn yeah. you know in light of eternity I, I've seen I've seen businesses five ten years and all of a sudden where do they go I've worked with people and, and there was very successful in, in certain places then all of a sudden business just went in the dumpster and the people who refused to speak about Jesus and that railed against those who were faithful lost their jobs. Guys, we're here for such a short time. Don't be afraid to share your faith. Depend upon Jesus. And if you haven't done so, please, please, don't wait another moment. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Look, we, we have coronavirus. We have, you know, the government has restrictions, whatnot. Honor them. But the Lord has made it so that uh, you can be creative. There are many um, masks that, like, uh, we came with one. It looks like the video game rating has a cross on it. It says, Jesus rated E for everyone. You know, if, if they want to make you wear a mask, Hallelujah! That means you're giving me an opportunity to share the gospel. <laughs> so, friends, commit your lives to Christ. Say, Jesus, I want to live for you and I don't care what it costs. I'll do it. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for your words.
In Jesus' name. Amen.